Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our August episode of Chain Reaction. My name is Taylor Young and I am the Assistant Director of the National Care to Conus Foundation. We are a patient advocacy program based in Southern California at the University of California, Irvine. NKCF provides information to patients and their families and raises public awareness of this cornea disease. We invite you to visit our website, nkcf.org, and sign up for our newsletter and to register for our bi-monthly webinars. We also post news on our Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. This is episode 17 of Chain Reaction, our Ask the Expert podcast. Our partner is Dr. Clark Chang, a noted keratoconus expert and friend of NKCF. We often receive questions about life with keratoconus and Dr. Chang has offered to share his advice on these questions. You can view past episodes by going to nkcf.org slash webinars. Dr. Chang is currently the Director of Specialty Contact Lenses on the Cornea Service at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. He is also a member of the Medical Affairs Team at Glaucos the company that makes the FDA-approved cross-linking product and equipment. He is a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry and a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. Welcome, Dr. Chang. Hi, Taylor. Welcome, everybody. Um, hope, every, hope everybody uh, is uh, staying cool for this summer. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Chang Reaction. Yes. Well, we have some great questions this month. And our first question comes from Pam in Illinois. Pam asks, what tests do eye doctors take to show the progression of keratoconus? Yes, um, Pam, that's an important question, of course, because uh, since the, so thank you for bringing that up because since the clinical staging of keratoconus and the amount of progression can guide the selection of management options or approaches recommended, it's certainly important to analyze and track keratoconus progression. But in order to do that, I think one must understand the clinical manifestations of keratoconus. Um, so at a very fundamental level, and I think maybe a lot of people already know this, so kind of indulge me and, and humor me for a few seconds here. Keratoconus progression leads to subsequent clinical protrusion of one's cornea. And that involves the front and the back of the cornea curvature protrusion-wise and eventually become more cone-like and also in the process thinning of the corneal tissue. So that means that keratoconus actually affects all layers of your um, corneal tissue front and back, not just the front like most people think. And why is that important? Because the corneal curvature steepening eventually will result in uh, frequent changes in one's glasses or contact lens prescription. And until at a point when the corneal geometric configuration becomes so irregular that glasses and standard contact lens, soft contact lenses that is, can no longer help to correct one's vision. And so the clinical attributes that I have just described are what eye doctors will use to track progression of keratoconus, including um, the type of um, changes in one's glasses or contact lens prescription, uh, the frequency of such prescription changes, decreases in one's vision or even quality of vision, like you know, start bursting, halo, double, triple vision, ghosting images, um, cornea and, and or uh, anatomical changes to one's cornea observed using a biomicroscope. Um, and those are the instruments that you link into with, with the light that the doctor examines the front part of your eye uh, or your or examine your eye during your eye exam. And perhaps also most importantly, changes observed in the uh, corneal shape, because we talked about curvature changes, right? So change uh, observed in the corneal shape and the distribution pattern of the corneal thickness across a known size area on your cornea. Those are the attributes that, are in, that the eye doctors often use to track progression or even to diagnose keratoconus. And so now the ability then to measure that corneal shape and the pattern of cornea thickness changes across your cornea 
are very essential because they typically allow for earlier detection of keratoconus and also its progression, much earlier than, say, waiting for your prescription to change, for example, or for your vision to decrease. And therefore, the clinical instruments then, back to your question, utilized to measure these attributes that I just talked about with the shape and the corneal thickness are what we commonly refer to as corneal topographer or corneal tomographer. And we'll talk about the differences between the two maybe beyond the scope of this question another day, but safe to say that both are heavily utilized to detect keratoconus and determine progression by eye doctors. So I hope that answers Judy. Um, I hope that answered Pam's question. Great. Um, could you just quickly give a little bit of what the difference between the topographer and a tomographer would be just for their reference if they hear that word in the office? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, many people are keratoconus patients. If you've been to your corneal evaluation or an eye exam that have been already been diagnosed with keratoconus, you've been most of most likely you've had an scanning done on the front part of the eye and it prints out a very colorful map like you're looking at geometric, uh, looking at geography or geology books where they, you know, look at mountain and use different color to denote different height. So you would have seen those print um, and that is the very basis uh, of this corneal topographer that basically uses uh, the technology measures the curvature changes at the front portion of the eye only. So it's able to detect keratoconus once it affects the front portion of the eye, whereas tomography uh, is able to detect the changes at the, both the front and the back of the cornea as both layers changes like this, right? So because of that, it's able to determine the curvature changes that we were talking about and even height changes or elevation changes, both front and back. And then deducing the two gives you the thickness of the tissue because you're you know, taking the front minus in the back. Um, so it gives you much more clinical information and again, earlier detection because it's able to derive more clinical value. So that on the, on the uh, you know, elementary level, that's the difference. Great, thank you so much. No problem. Well, our next question is from Judy in Wisconsin. And Judy asks, I have keratoconus in both eyes and it has become very difficult to fit my left eye with a contact lens. What can I do? Right. Well, Judy, uh, you know, again, great question. I, and I hope that I, I don't think that not all hope is lost. So let's go through this as slowly. And hopefully my answer can give you some level of comfort. It's not unusual that keratoconus is very asymmetrical, meaning one eye across the middle line of your body, meaning one eye is typically a lot worse than the other. And so it makes sense that if the left eye is the more severe keratoconus staging eye, that may be potentially that's the eye that is more difficult to fit in contact lenses. So um, as keratoconus progresses and assumes more and more of that conical protrusion that we're talk of, talking about, so more cone-like, your corneal tissue becomes more cone-like it then becomes more clinically challenging to allow a contact lens to maintain its stability on the eye because it has less areas to balance itself, right? Now the, you know, the peak of the keratoconus cornea is likely the only area that it's balancing itself on. So it's much less stable. And also then the level of tolerance to wearing that lens can become uh, reduced. And I do wanna say before I go on that incidentally, when I say the corneal tissue becomes more cone-like, I mean the cornea, not the entire eye. And I said that because I've had patients ask me about does the eye becomes more bulbous or bulgy. And um, because it's only the corneal portion that's changing, not the entire eye, it does not affect the external appearance of the eye. And I, um, the secondary reason to mention that is because I don't want patients at home to use that to monitor their, themselves, the, whether or not their keratoconus is progressing. It's not something that you are able to determine. Um, anatomically or by shape by looking yourself that's why you have to rely on the tomographer and the tomographer that uh, and other clinical tests that we talked about uh, in the last question from Pam but regardless as keratoconus continue to worsen that certainly as what I describe in the mechanism of the stabilization mechanism of the contact lens obviously the difficulty level to custom fit a specialty contact lens for keratoconus eye also increases as the level of um, severity is increasing. So whenever keratoconus progression is detected, 
it is more important to make sure that we can stabilize the eye so that it doesn't continue to get worse, at least in my opinion, before deciding on the clinical approach taken in redesigning or refitting the keratoconus content lens for visual correction. Because once your eyes are stabilized or keratoconus is stabilized, you're still going to require most likely content lens, uh, specialty lenses to improve your vision. So having said that, it's also worth mentioning that modern advancement in contact lens technologies for keratoconus patients have really improved so much that has in recent years really largely helped to improve fitting successes in eyes that are very severe, um, where a decade ago we may actually say there's no other option now, you have to go for a corneal transplant or other surgeries. Nowadays it's different. So you have some options here. I would first suggest Consult with your eye doctors to make sure that your keratoconus is not progressing. If it is progressing, it is important to talk to your eye doctor and see if corneal cross-linking is right for you, as we do have an FDA-approved uh, treatment method available in US. But if your keratoconus is stable based on corneal tomography that we had discussed prior, then whether it's before or after you know, stabilization with cross-linking, if you have self-stabilized, that's okay too. That's even better actually, because then given the improvement that I had talked about with contact lens technology nowadays, you should have other options. So what you should do then uh, as a second step is to then consult a contact lens specialist but not just any content lens specialist, in my opinion. I think a content lens specialist, and I say this because you're sounding like you've already tried many different lens options. Um, so going to a content lens specialist in, in, in your situation, who I think has access to be able to evaluate many different type of lenses on you, I think that would be more helpful at this moment. And I say that because most patients and even some eye doctors think that oh, there's only one best type of contact lens for keratoconus patients. And that typically leads to you know, changing and adjusting that one single type of contact lens over and over again. And then patient tends to then give up because they feel like, well, I've already failed what is supposedly the best contact lens for keratoconus patient. So there's nothing else there out there for me anymore. That's actually not true. And that's why it's important to work with a contact lens specialist, uh, or maybe sometimes even different specialists who each evaluate different type of lenses if needed to give you better outcome. So you can work with your eye doctor to identify a referral clinic that is right for you, uh, or consult the doctor locator that uh, we have on the NKCF website, which I know is uh, a new version is coming. Um, so, um, you know, watch out for that in September. And also as well as maybe Dr. Locator resources on other professional organization websites such as Scleral Lens Education Society or the Gas Permeable Lens Institute. And we could type out the name of, the, uh, of those organizations for you in the comment section so that you could refer to that. And Judy, I hope that uh, we'll be able to give you some more resources to look into. Thank you. Yes, we'll definitely have those links to the organizations in our referral list in the description. And our third and final question comes from Sulov in Idaho, who says, I have been diagnosed with keratoconus since age eight, and I'm now in my 40s. I used to wear corneal GPs, and I'm now wearing scleral lenses. I'd like to know if different HOA correcting scleral lenses all aim to reduce the same level of HOA. Right, that obviously a very technical question. So I can certainly hear that Sulov has is a very experienced keratoconus lens wearer, which uh, and wearing lenses, you know, seemingly very successfully. So again, inspiring story for other patients and um, you know patients like Judy that we could reach that. Uh, with modern technology um, in breakthroughs in contact lenses as long as keratoconus is not getting worse. So, so this is a great story and, and question. Thank you, Sulov, for that. Um, so, and in case, before I go on, anybody's wondering, what is HOA, which stands for higher order aberration? And we touched uh, up on this a little bit two episodes ago using a, case, a patient case um, that actually uh, involved using this technology, which is very new in the United States. Uh, I believe it's episode 15, so feel free to go back for a refresher if you need to. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier today, 
the corneal geometric configuration becomes more cone-like or more asymmetrical or more irregular. You'll hear these words a lot when you go for your evaluation. Um, as keratoconus, caria, uh, as keratoconus cornea uh, protrudes and become more and more cone-like, you'll hear those words asymmetrical, irregular, um, and conical, and things like that. So it's just a reflection of the severity of keratoconus and the curvature change. And so what happens with the curvature changes is that when the light rays that carries external uh, visual information from the external world coming towards the cornea, it first has to go from air and then contacts your corneal tissue and then enters the eye. So this asymmetry on the contour of the cornea as it bends and protrudes forward disperses or bends the light ray to such a point that it is not focusable, it doesn't go straight to the back of the eye or the back of your retina where your photoreceptors and your optic nerve uh, are located. And this leads to the generation of a very blurred image um, produced for visual processing in the brain. So first of all, your vision really is governed by more than just your eyes. Um, and in any case, the, that amount of light ray dispersion, so it's not focused in a straight line, it's dispersed at an angle. So it produces that very blurred visual signal and it's very weak signal. Um, and that's a combination of, uh, and it's, it's a combination of what we call lower order aberration and higher order aberration. So both of them um, affect how the light ray is being focused in the back of the eye. So the amount of the aberration that can be corrected, meaning the light can be bent back into more of a straight line, can be corrected by glasses or soft, standard soft lenses. We call those lower order aberration because they're easier to um, correct. Whereas the other part the, that is caused by the higher order aberration, that dispersion of light ray, um, cannot be corrected by glasses uh, or content lenses. We call them higher order aberrations. So they, these higher order aberration causes faulty signals uh, to your vision, if you think about it that way, that can only be partially or mostly corrected by specialty content lenses uh, and possibly some forms of corneal surgery because they aim to try to improve the shape of the front part of the eye, right? Um, so when the specialty content lens for keratoconus uh, covers up the misshapen curvature on the front part of the eye, it while it does that very well and is able to reduce some of the higher order aberration, they don't really cover the back of the cornea. And remember I say your keratoconus uh, condition can affect both your front part of your cornea, but also the back part of your cornea. So the back part of the cornea continues to bend the light and create higher order aberration. And that is the reason why for some patients, even with the best fitting contact lens at the front part of the eye, they still feel like they have the, you know, these visual symptoms that is related to the higher order, uh, high order aberrations, such as very blurry images, ghosting, um, you know, shadows or star bursting. But mind you, better than with glasses or anything else. Um, so in this case, what needs to be done is we need to figure out a way to produce extra correction power for high order aberration on the front part of the content lens. And that it's taken us a long time to be able to make some leeway in making that available. And that's, I'm referring it to it as uh, HOA correcting optics or the add-on HOAs that can be further corrected by these limited content lens design. So when a content lens, when a keratoconus content lens um, uh, so uh, I sh let me take a step back. So coming back to answering Sulov's question then, for any given content lens patient, doesn't what I just said mean that the as long as the content lens is on the eye, then the amount of that HOA correction, whether it's the front portion HOA or the additional back portion HOA or internal eye, isn't that exactly the same regardless of you know, what lens you put on the eye? The answer actually is no. And I know that sounds confusing. Wouldn't the total amount of um, visual noises be exactly the same regardless of what lens you put on? There are two main reasons. Um, at least two. So then let me just touch up on these two main reasons why that would be the case, uh, meaning that the HOA, total HOA contained by the lens um, is actually different. So number one, I just mentioned that there are only a few lens designs that are available to incorporate these you know, additional uh, HOA correcting optics. So some of the, there's a couple 
designs that have figured out through research that they could slightly change the shape of the front part of the eye. We call that a sphericity value of the lens. The, they can change the shape a little bit and achieve a slightly more HOA correction. Um, and so if that's the type of scleral lens you're using, it's not able to correct the full spectrum of this residual HOA that is caused by the internal eye structure or the back of the eye. So therefore, it will have limitation in terms of how much HOA correction it can actually contain. So that's number one. That's why even if you match that compared to something that can correct more of a full spectrum of HOA uh, visual interferences, they would be they would contain different amount of correction. But more importantly, number two, the and this is the part that I think a lot of people may actually ignore, and that is the fitting position or the resting position of the lens where it stabilizes on the eye it actually can also induce extra higher order aberration. So any optical object that you view through can have the ability to induce more visual interferences or faulty visual signal if it's not fit correctly. And this is where fitting, um, selecting the best lens to match, also the fitting parameter of the lens and the fitting skill becomes very important um, because that since that positional differences on the eye will lead to different amount of total HOA that needs to be added up, um, then that you know obviously means that a better fitting lens will actually require a total a lesser amount in total of HOA correction that needs to be added onto the lens and likely also provide better overall visual result and for those at least for those two reasons you can hear that that's why each lens depending on how it's fit depending on the technology that it utilizes will actually contain different amount of HOA correction in the lens I know it's confusing. I, I was that okay, uh, Taylor? Do you feel like that kind of got the job done and answers to Love's question? Yes, definitely. I think it's a complex subject inherently, but I think you answered it great. And I'm sure they could also ask their doctor if they have any remaining questions, or they can write to us if if they have um, further questions about it, and we'd be happy to answer. Absolutely. I will, I love answering your questions. So keep writing those questions in. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Chang, for answering these questions and always being so helpful. And everyone can look for another episode next month. We release new episodes on the first of every month with answers to more questions about all things keratoconus. If anyone listening has a question that they would like answered in a future episode, you can go to the NKCF website and under the For Patients tab, you'll see the section called Ask the Expert Chain Reaction. If you click here, there'll be a text box that you can submit a question to us. And finally, NKCF operates with the support of friends and donors. So if you feel the urge to support us, you can make a much appreciated online donation to the UCI Foundation. In closing, I just again want to thank you, Dr. Chang, and thank you everyone for listening and writing in. Yes, thank you everyone. Looking forward to the next episode. Like I said, love answering your questions, so please keep them coming. Yes, thank you everyone. See you next time. Bye.